Hello everyone, in this video we are going to investigate the motion of a particle moving in one dimension under gravity and also under the influence of a quadratic drag force. In other words, the drag force is proportional to the square of the speed of the particle. So we'll focus on the case of just taking a ball and throwing it vertically straight upwards and seeing what happens to it. We're pretty much forced to consider this special case where the particle only moves along uh, a single line, hence one dimensional, because it's impossible to solve analytically for the full 2D trajectory of a particle moving under quadratic drag. I did some videos a couple of years ago um, about uh, the trajectory of a particle with no drag and with linear drag, but with quadratic drag the differential equations you get are just impossible to solve. The physical motivation, by the way, for thinking about the quadratic drag case as opposed to just the linear drag case is that this is simply a more realistic model um, for typical projectiles going through air, uh, which would have a size that's not negligible and a fairly high velocity. So let's get on with solving the problem. I've just sketched out a little diagram to introduce some of the key parameters of the problem. You've got some force arrows uh, on your particle pointing downwards. You've got mg, where m is the mass of the particle, so that's of course the weight. And this other force arrow acting downwards um, is the drag force. I've labeled it as b y dot squared. So y dot is the time derivative of y and is therefore the velocity of the particle. And b is just the coefficient of proportionality that converts your squared velocity into a drag force. Um, I should also mention that for this video we're going to focus specifically on the part of the motion where the particle is moving upwards. Things are a bit different when it's moving downwards because those two force arrows are then pointing in opposite directions and you get a slightly different differential equation which has a different solution. But I'll do a separate video on that um, after this. Uh, other things I've marked on my diagram are this u, which is simply the initial upwards velocity of the particle. And we've got a scale um, on our y-axis. y is just the axis point pointing upwards. And we've defined our particle to start at y equals zero. And it's going to reach a maximum height. And I've called the maximum height h. In terms of what we're actually trying to solve for, the main result really is going to be y as a function of time. So where the particle is at any given moment in time. And we'll find a couple of associated results along the way. In particular, we'll find the time taken to reach the maximum height and also an expression for the maximum height itself. So we're going to start by just applying Newton's second law to our particle. The mass times acceleration term is of course just m y double dot. y double dot is the second time derivative of y and is therefore the acceleration in the direction of increasing y, in other words upwards. Now because of that, when we set this equal to the resultant force, both of our forces need minus signs because you can see they're both pointing downwards. So this is minus mg minus by dot squared. At this point, we've already constructed the differential equation, which we ultimately need to solve. The problem is it's not straightforward because it's nonlinear because of this y dot squared term. And therefore, we're going to need a different approach from what you might be used to doing. Um, you know, usually when we construct differential equations using Newton's second law, we can uh, sort of guess a sensible trial solution, substitute it in and check that it works. That's very hard to do in this case. So the way we can get around that is reimagine this as a differential equation. Instead of a second order differential equation for y, you reimagine it as a first order differential equation for y dot, and then you solve for y dot first, right? By which I mean you just write your y double dot as dy dot by dt. And the right hand side can stay the same because it's already just in terms of uh, y dot. So if you forget for a second that the dot means a derivative, this now looks like a nonlinear first order differential equation. Even more nicely, it's actually a separable first order differential equation, meaning you can get the y dots on one side and the t's on the other side and then just integrate both sides. So if we divide both sides by um, basically all of that stuff there, but we leave the minus sign on the right hand side, we can rewrite this as m dy dot over b y dot squared plus mg is equal to minus dt. Now before we go ahead and integrate this, I just want to rewrite it uh, a little bit and introduce some new parameters just to make life easier. Um, for one thing, it would be nice if the coefficient of y squared was just one. That would make the integration a bit easier. So we can take a b out of the denominator of that fraction and have a prefactor of m over b. Then you're going to have dy dot over just y dot squared plus mg over b. Now this combination mg over b is going to turn up all over the place throughout our working so it would be sensible to give it its own name so that we don't have to write out the same uh, stuff a lot of times and I'm going to write down over here I'm going to define it as 
capital V squared. When I say capital V squared is defined as mg of B, then we can put a V squared there. Why am I calling it V squared? Well, two reasons. Firstly, simply because including the squared in the definition will make the integral work out much more neatly, as we'll see in a moment. But secondly, there's a nice physical interpretation of V as defined in this way, which you can see just by rearranging that definition to get B V squared equals mg. Now, remember that the drag force in general is B y dot squared, and therefore B V squared can be interpreted as the drag force the particle would have when it has velocity V. And therefore, the equation B V squared equals mg is expressing a kind of balance of forces. It's saying the drag force at velocity V is equal to the weight. Now, if you imagine for a second that the particle were falling down rather than moving up, uh, if the drag force and the weight were balanced, that would mean there's no resultant force on the particle, and therefore the particle would have reached terminal velocity. Therefore, the conclusion of all of this is that you can interpret V uh, as the square root of mg over B as the terminal velocity that the particle would have if it were moving downwards. I also want to define one more derived parameter. I'm going to call this gamma, and I'm going to define it to be B over M. That means this M over B prefactor can be written as 1 over gamma. You might be wondering, why didn't I define gamma as m over b so that the prefactor was just gamma? This is um, basically just to be consistent with what we tend to do in simple harmonic motion, where we define our damping coefficient as b over m, or sometimes b over, uh, over 2m. Um, anyway, so now we're ready to integrate. Let's put an integral there, the right-hand side of our uh, differential equation, which is minus dt. So we get minus the integral of dt. Now this is the kind of integral that uh, trig substitutions will help with. In particular here, um, standard substitution to make this kind of integral is let your y dot equal v tan theta, simply because the relevant trig identities make it work out, as we'll see in a moment. Differentiate both sides of that. You can include that dy dot is v sec squared of theta, d theta, just the derivative of tan. Um, the other thing we want to know is what's the denominator of our integrand in terms of theta. So let's figure that out. Well, y dot squared plus v squared. Um, you can factor out a v squared because when you square this, you're going to get a v squared as your coefficient. So you can write that as v squared times 1 plus tan squared theta. But then there's a trig identity that tells you that 1 plus tan squared is sec squared. And so this is v squared sec squared theta. Now you can see why this works, right? Because the sec squareds are going to cancel. So if we substitute back in to our integral in terms of theta, still got your 1 over gamma um, prefactor, then your dy dot over y dot squared plus v squared uh, is just going to be d theta on the top because the sec squareds cancel, and v on the bottom because you have v over v squared. The right hand side. Um, it's just minus the integral of dt, which is minus t plus a constant. I'm going to call it capital T because it has dimensions of time, and we'll think about the interpretation of that capital T um, later on. Now, the integral of d theta over v is easy because it's just theta over v because, uh, well, v is a constant. And so uh, going back to our definition of theta, you can see that theta is inverse tan of y dot over v, and therefore the left-hand side becomes 1 over gamma v. Um, inverse tan of y dot over v, and we can just absorb that constant of integration from the left-hand side into the one on the right-hand side. We don't need another constant, so just minus t plus big T. Um, finally, we can just rearrange this, um, multiply both sides by gamma v, uh, take the tan of both sides, and then times by v, and you conclude that y dot as a function of time is v tan of gamma v uh, into big T minus little t. We can also apply our initial condition that, uh, remember the initial velocity is u upwards, um, so that can be used to uh, find out what big T is. Um, so if we require that y dot at time zero is u, just substitute that into the previous line, you get u is v uh, tan of gamma v uh, capital T, because this little t is just zero, and then you rearrange that, um, and you get t is 1 over gamma v uh, inverse tan of u over v. So we know what our constant of integration t is in terms of the parameters of the problem, which is nice, but how can we actually interpret what big t means? 
Well, notice that when little t equals big T, right, in the previous line, an expression for y dot as a function of t, if t minus t equals zero, then y dot is zero because tan of zero is zero. So that's saying that when the time is equal to capital T, the velocity is instantaneously zero. Um, the only time when the velocity can be instantaneously zero is when the particle is changing its direction of motion, right? It's moving up and velocity is getting smaller and smaller, it eventually becomes negative. So at its maximum height, the velocity will be zero. Therefore, the interpretation of big T is it is the time taken for the particle to reach its maximum height. So that's a nice interpretation. Another thing that you may or may not be concerned about is the fact that tan has asymptotes and is undefined at certain values like uh, pi over 2 when its argument is pi over 2. Um, so you might be wondering whether that's a problem. Well, consider that our expression for big T down here tells us that big T has a maximum value, right? Because inverse tan can't be bigger than pi over 2. Um, in particular, the combination gamma VT is always going to be less than pi over 2, right? So then you go back to the previous line. Notice that this is basically the argument of the tan is gamma VT minus gamma VT, or gamma V capital T minus gamma V little t. But we already said that gamma V big T has to be less than pi over 2. So the argument of your tan there is pi over 2 minus something, and therefore um, you never reach the stage where the argument of that tan um, is, is pi over 2, so there are no problems with that. And also note that because of the interpretation of big T as the time to reach the maximum height, our original differential equation is only valid up to the point where little t equals big T. Beyond that, we need to take into account the different directions of the weight and the drag force. And so this expression for y dot is only valid um, when little t is uh, less than big T, and therefore the argument of this tangent is always bigger than zero, right? Because big T mi minus little t is always bigger than zero. So we don't have any problems with asymptotes or uh, negative values or, or anything like that. So I've just kept a summary of the key results so far up at the top. And now what we have to do is basically integrate that because y dot is dy by dt, and we ultimately want y itself, right? So let's try and integrate it. And the usual way to integrate tan is to use the fact that tan is sine over cos. So let's do that. Y is V times the integral of, well, sine of all of that stuff, gamma V T minus T over cos of the same stuff, gamma V T minus uh, T with respect to time. Um, it's still not that obvious. Um, or at least, you know, maybe you can write down the answer, um, but you have to be a little bit careful with uh, chain rule and minus signs and so on. So I'm going to do it using a substitution and let alpha and mu parameter be defined as the argument of the trig function, which is gamma V T minus T. And that means that D alpha is just minus gamma V um, D T. Uh, then our integrand simplifies very nicely. You've got V times the integral of sine alpha over cos alpha times, um, it's going to be minus d alpha over gamma v. And the v is cancelled, the prefactor and the, the v and the denominator cancel. You are left with 1 over gamma as your prefactor. And I notice that minus sine, in other words, this sine combined with that minus, is the derivative of cos. Therefore, you've got one of these cases where the top of your fraction is the derivative of the bottom and then you get the natural log of the modulus of the denominator. Um, so we're going to get ln of modulus of cos alpha plus some constant of integration. Now, do I actually need those modular signs? Well, this goes back to what we were saying um, a little bit earlier about the argument of this uh, tan function um, that appears in y dot. The argument of the tan function is just alpha, right, by definition. We concluded earlier that that quantity has to be between 0 and pi over 2. If that quantity is between 0 and pi over 2, then the cosine of that quantity is between 0 and 1, and therefore it's not negative, and we don't need the modular signs anyway. So I'm going to drop those modular signs um, from the next line. And in fact, let's go ahead and write that down. So y is 1 over gamma um, log of, let's substitute back, um, put t instead of alpha log of cos of alpha, which is gamma v t minus t, and then we've still got our constant. Um, we can apply a rather initial condition to find the constant, which is that we define the particle to start at a y value of zero, right? So y when t equals zero is equal to zero. Um, 
what does that imply? Well, the left-hand side of the equation is just zero. This term here, essentially that t disappears. And so for all of that to be zero, c has to be minus all of that, right? So let me write that down. c has to be minus one over gamma um, ln of cos of gamma v big T. Then you can sub that back into your expression for y and use the fact that when you subtract two logarithms, you can combine them into a single logarithm where you divide the arguments. And so this um, gives us our final expression for y, which is one over gamma natural log of, uh, it's gonna be cos of gamma v t minus t over cos of just gamma v t. So we've achieved two out of three of our goals. We've got the time to the maximum height, capital T. We've got y as a function of time. The only thing remaining to do is find expression for h, the maximum height reached. Um, so we can use our expression for y to do that. Um, and all we have to do is substitute uh, little t equals big T because big T was interpreted as the time to reach the maximum height, right? So h is simply gonna be one over gamma, natural log of, well, when uh, when little t equals big T, t minus t is zero. So you get cos of zero, but cos of zero is just one, right? So this is ln of one over cos gamma v t. Um, if you want to make that look a little bit neater, you can write the one over cos as sec, right? So it's one over gamma ln of sec of gamma v t. And there we go, we've got our expression for h. So I've just put at the bottom of the screen there, uh, the full explicit expressions for the time to maximum height and the maximum height itself in terms of all the original parameters. Um, let's have a look at those and see, uh, well, whether we can make any comments about them. Uh, first thing I'll say is I'm not gonna do this in this video because it's, uh, it's not that interesting to go through the process, but if you do a Taylor expansion um, of T and of H, uh, you will see that in the limit of small b, you recover the expressions that you would get just from doing your standard um, constant acceleration SUVAT equations for the maximum height and the time to reach the maximum height. So that's always reassuring. I also wanted to point out one other fact that I thought was interesting and wasn't necessarily obvious to me in advance, but uh, you know we, we've already pointed out earlier that big T has a maximum possible value because inverse 10 has a maximum possible value of pi over two, right? So there is a maximum possible time to reach maximum height in the quadratic drag regime. How about for H itself? Is there a maximum possible height? Because it seems reasonable to think there might be if there's a maximum possible time to reach the maximum height. Well, um, as U gets bigger and bigger, you know, intuitively you'd expect more velocity to mean more height. So we consider the large U limit. Um, as U goes to infinity, inverse tan goes to pi over two. What about sec of that? Well, sec is one over cos, cos of pi over two is zero. And so sec of pi over two is undefined. It goes to infinity, right? And taking the natural log of that doesn't really change anything. Um, I guess it just makes it grow to infinity a bit more slowly. But the conclusion is that as u goes to infinity, uh, h is unbounded. h can go to infinity as well. So we have this slightly unusual situation where there's a, a maximum time taken to reach you know, the maximum height, but there isn't a limit to the height itself. This actually contrasts with the results that you get in the undamped case, where both the time and the maximum height are unbounded. Like the bigger the velocity is, the bigger the time and the bigger the height. I guess one way to interpret that would be that as u grows, if h is already large and you make u even larger, h is going to get bigger, but it's going to grow fairly slowly because of this log term, right? Like the log function doesn't grow that quickly, you know, roughly speaking, um, for large values of its argument. So if you increase the velocity, you give it more distance to go, but not that much more distance to go, right? And so you can imagine the ball, the extra velocity that you give the ball um, is kind of enough to be able to make up that extra distance in the same total amount of time. I think in retrospect, that is kind of intuitive, but uh, I hadn't really thought about that before I derived these results. So that was interesting. And I hope you've also found this interesting. I'll be doing another video very soon on what happens when the ball falls downwards. And I uh, hope to see you again soon for that video.